Some years ago, there was, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think scandal is, is a proper word to use for it. There was uh, maybe a little controversy because, and I think it was uh, perhaps Clinton's vice president went out and addressed uh, the people, the monks and nuns and lay people at Shilai uh, Monastery. And the abbess at that time instructed the monks and nuns there to write out a check to that vice president. I never can remember who it is. You know, the vice president, I think if you want to be forgotten by history, you become a vice president and nobody ever knows who you were. Uh, unless you happen to get lucky, like Truman, you know, and then become president. Um, and so there was, there was a lot of uh, brouhaha because of the separation of church and state, what's going on here. And uh, the people at Shilai said, well, you know, this was not the temple donating to the, the, the uh, political uh, campaign. This was the individual monks and nuns donating. Therefore, there was nothing improper about it. And then somebody in the news media said, well, okay, we don't understand because monks take a vow of poverty. And uh, the Chinese abbot said, well, no, we don't. We don't take a vow of poverty. And so that immediately got my attention because in the sense that uh, uh, the Catholic orders take a vow of poverty. Well, we don't take a vow of poverty that way. But there are some essential rules that a novice takes, and one of them is not to keep gold or silver. Now, of course, this is open to interpretation. Everything is open to interpretation. But um, in the old days, there was no paper money. The only money that existed with these are gold or silver. And so the monks were not allowed to have any money. That sounds kind of like a vow of poverty to me. But the Chinese said, oh no, 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 no. They have, they have bank accounts and they write a check. And so obviously uh, they're not handling money because they're writing a check and they're telling the bank to pay the money to them. And okay, it sounds like we're really massaging this so I have to go back and think, Okay, so what originally happened in the tradition? Well, what originally happened is lay people came along, they wanted to donate to the Sangha. They wanted to help the Sangha. Sometimes they donated cloth so that robes could be made. Sometimes they actually came out to where the Sangha was gathered and donated food. And we have, in uh, this modern age, we have a vision of the monks like in Thailand going out with their enormous begging bowls and begging food and going back and and all of it looks wonderfully simplistic but the reason those bowls got big instead of small was because some monks are too old to go out and beg so the younger monks would beg for more than themselves so it, it gets complicated that's uh, you know, why Mary has a job because she's a lawyer because these things get complicated and you have to somehow figure out what was really going on. And if things were donated to the Sangha, somebody was appointed to take care of those things. And if money was donated to the Sangha, there was always a lay person that took that money and kept it for the Sangha. And so what would it be used for? Well, it could be used to buy food for sick monks. It could be used to buy medicine. It could be used to buy cloth because traditionally twice a year the monks' uh, uh, robes are made available for the monks and sometimes the monks make the robes. Um, so there's a use for money. If a monk has, in modern times, if a monk has to go to a doctor, the doctor has to be paid maybe. Uh, Nowadays, we, everything gets rather complicated. Most monks travel in cars. If we followed the old rules, there would be no Buddhism here because nobody could have ever got on an airplane because you weren't allowed to go further than 10 miles a day. So how are you going to do that? So if we get real literal, and I had a Theravadan acquaintance who commented on this, that everybody had to break a precept to come to America. 
So perhaps a checking account, perhaps, that is the equivalent of we have a layperson, they actually have a name which I never can remember, who takes the money. So if Chuck wanted to give me some money because he knew I needed some money, he would have to give it to Mary who would keep it for me and I would say to Mary, could you go pick up my prescription at Target because uh, I can't handle money. And Mary being the wonderful person she is, she'll say, yes, when I get time, I'll go and pick up your prescription at Target. It's rather complicated. Uh, I would have to drag Mary around with me all the time, which would break another precept so that I could purchase gasoline to put in my truck to drive to Orange County. And I think that perhaps this is why the Theravada monks spend most of their time trying to figure out how to follow the rules. It doesn't leave a lot of time for meditation. It's much simpler to simply say that perhaps we shouldn't be wealthy. It's okay to have some money to buy gas with. We have to pay uh, our insurance on the truck. I just got my thing that said I have to go smog my truck and pay a bunch of money to re-register it, which happens every year. And so um, perhaps it's not really reasonable to, for me to drag Mary around all the time to get her to take care of these things for me. An interesting, an interesting facet of this is that uh, in my studies, I came across this bit that people in China, when they become monks, do not have to give up any wealth they have. I thought that was really interesting. In India, when they left home, they left everything behind. They left their bank accounts and they left their property and they left their nice civilian clothes and they joined the Sangha and they received a robe and, and they got three robes uh, which they could put on to get warmer and warmer and warmer in cold weather. Very practical. But in China, they were not, the monks were not allowed because Buddhism changed quite a bit when I went to China. They didn't have to give up their bank account. They didn't have to give up property. Now they couldn't technically live on the property, but they could still own the property. Which is probably why the abbot of Shilai said, well, no, we don't, have a, we don't have a vow of poverty. So I found that kind of interesting. Now this brings up uh, something else that I ran across that made me think about it today. is because I'm always having to try to come up with a talk that isn't the, the same talk I gave last month, you know, that's a little bit different. And... I ran across a thing from a, a Japanese tradition uh, center in Los Angeles where I was reading something and they started talking about uh, making sure that people uh, did not, that people were not encouraged to become poor. And I really thought about that a lot because it's part of the, their practice and the way they approach things is encouraging people not to become poor. And of course, I didn't have anybody from that center to say, okay, exactly what do you mean by this? What does it mean when you say, don't become poor? Uh, they didn't have anything in there about discouraging people from becoming wealthy. It just had discouraging people from poverty. And poverty is an interesting word, you know, because in educational ease, uh, oh, about 20 years ago, the, the latest fad was to talk about, instead of talking about lower class people, you talked about people from poverty. Thereby, you didn't say anything negative about them. Because, you know, we keep changing the way we talk so that nobody will get offended. And so now we talk about people from poverty who don't have everything that everybody else has. I even had, in those days, I had to go to some classes on this, of dealing with children from poverty. And what did that mean? Well, it probably meant that they didn't have a nice varied diet, that they ate a lot of McDonald's instead of eating lots of fresh vegetables, which, by the way, don't cost any more money than McDonald's. But that's, that's a whole thing of understanding poverty. 
So I thought about this place that said, don't encourage people to be, well, what does that mean? Part of what it means is that the Japanese tradition as it's manifested itself in this country, we're usually talking about people that have careers. And for the most part, we're talking about monks that have careers outside of being monks. Now, I will, I will uh, recognize the fact that in most situations, the teacher, let me put those quote marks on it since I'm being videoed, the teacher usually doesn't have a career outside the temple, but the rank and file monks very often have careers outside the temple. Uh, and sometimes uh, in, in the Japanese Zen tradition in this company, country, very often these careers, they're what we think of as careers. They're doctors and lawyers and, and uh, movie stars and highly successful artists, highly successful people in what they do. And I had to ask myself, what does that mean? Don't encourage people to be poor. Don't encourage poverty. This morning we were talking about my brother in the Dharma, who's no longer with us by the name of Suhita Dharma, who was also known as Tikam Duk, and he was a monk that was poor. When he would go to move from one place to another, very often he would have a box of books for me because he didn't drag them after him and everything fit in a couple of bags that he wanted to take with him. And so I, I think we could say that he, he lived in a kind of poverty. He didn't have a lot of stuff. I never knew him to own a car. Okay, so he lived in a kind of poverty. And I wonder if a place that says, well, don't encourage people, and I think they're talking about monks, to live in poverty is that maybe they're saying, it's another way of saying, it would be nice if they earned a lot of money because we have bills. I don't know, because I don't have anybody to ask about what that means. But I know that if you spend a lot of time worrying about money, you don't spend a lot of time worrying about the Dharma. And that somewhere there has to be a happy medium in here. Now, one of the unique things about American Buddhism is that almost all American Buddhist monks and nuns that I know have to work. There's no other way for it to happen. Uh, if, they, if the Buddhist monks and nuns that I know go and practice and live at an ethnic center, meaning it's Japanese or Vietnamese or Chinese or Korean, there's a possibility they will be supported there and they do not have to work. But if they plan on having their own practice center, somebody's got to work. And that's the reality of it. One of the, the biggest centers we have is, uh, well, San Francisco Zen Center that Mary was at. Everybody worked there but Shinru Suzuki. Everybody worked there. Worked jobs. LA Zen Center. Everybody worked there except Maizumi Roshi. This is normal. The center that I entered the order at the only person who didn't work was Matsuoka Roshi. Everybody else worked. That's the only way we could pay the bills. So this is, a, I guess we could call it an American phenomenon, and I guess I finally found something that actually is American Buddhism. I've been looking for the last four decades for something we could call American Buddhism. And I guess everybody working except for the primary teacher is a distinctive thing about it. So how do we deal with this poverty? Well, I think it's very self-serving to tell monks, don't go out and be, you know, don't, don't embrace poverty. I think poverty is a state of mind rather than a state of, of ownership. And uh, being a monk that travels, not a lot, but since I travel up and down the Cajon Pass and have to go for two or three hours to go where I'm going or to Las Vegas, I really need a vehicle that I can depend upon. Having broken down on the road, it's kind of hard to explain to people why you're a day late coming to a class you're supposed to teach because your car, which is a piece of junk, broke down. 
So I, I, I feel very confident now. Of course, my truck is 11 years old and has 150,000 miles on it. And I'm sure it's going to keep going for another 100,000 miles, I hope. But uh, I, I think that's reasonable. I think that has nothing to do with wealth. I think it's very practical. If I ask you to cut a piece of wood, I would not expect you to go out and buy the cheapest saw you could buy so that you could spend all day messing up a piece of wood. I would expect you to buy a good tool and use that tool and cut a piece of wood for me. And I think the same thing applies to things like cars. I had a friend years ago at the International Buddhist Meditation Center and when we'd have a celebration, my teacher always invited everybody from every tradition that he could get to come. So that we had everything, in, everybody in the world was there. And the Theravadans would drive up and they would be driving Mercedes Benz. And it really bothered him. It really, really bothered him. He'd go, I just don't understand that. And at the time I didn't say anything because I didn't understand, but I knew I didn't understand. He was not saying he didn't understand, he was saying he disapproved. Right, Eric? Yeah. I didn't understand, but I thought I'd wait until I found out what was going on. What was going on is none of those monks owned those cars. Those cars belonged to somebody in the Sangha because in Theravadan tradition, very often the people that support the Vihara or the temple are doctors and lawyers. And they have money. Because the monks don't have any money because they have a rule against having money. They can't even touch money. You have to give it to them wrapped in a piece of cloth, which they turn around and give to their Mary. So those cars never belonged to them anyway. But he didn't, well, why are they in a Mercedes Benz? Because these doctors and lawyers venerate these monks as being holy people. And they're not going to put them in an old Ford pickup and drive them to the temple. So that's understandable. But this interesting phenomenon we have about how much is enough. How big does your house need to be? And you could say to me, quite rightly, how many guitars do you need to own? Well, I only need one more. One more, that's all I need, and then I've got enough. But why is this even important to Buddhism? It's important because we're talking about attachment. We're talking about if you lose it, what happens? Now I've listened to an awful lot of people. I know one monk who one time I walked into his house. Well, it's interesting if he hears, if he actually listens to my talks. I don't think he does. But if he listens to my talks, I'm going to get a phone call. He's not going to be happy. But I walked into his house, which probably was worth about, at, at his temple, I won't say where it was. But uh, it was, the house was probably $5 million. And he had been very successful in his career. And uh, he had a very nice house. And I walked in and I was stunned. Absolutely stunned. It was the first time I met him. And I looked at this house with its 20, 25 foot vaulted ceilings. And, and just, oh, and I could look straight out the back window to a swimming pool and a spa all owned by a monk, and I said, wow. And he says, oh, it's only stuff. It's only stuff. Well, yeah, it is only stuff. It's only stuff unless you're really attached to it, and then it's a possession. And far be it for me to say, well, prove to me that you're not attached to this stuff. But we, we cross a line where things become very, very iffy. And I think we need to test ourselves. I used to have a disciple who went to the prisons, and I told that disciple, I said, you can go and you can teach meditation, because that's what the request was. But don't get confused and start acting like the teacher, because this disciple was a novice. And I, and I learned from that disciple never to send a, a novice out to do that kind of work again, because it went to that novice's head, and the next thing I knew, that novice was giving interviews at the prison. They took inmates off out of the main chapel into a side space and talked with them. It's not allowed. Okay? But that disciple liked to ignore the rules. So, 
Later on, when I started going to prison on a regular basis, I realized how many rules that disciple had broken. At that time, I just visited once in a great while. That disciple, I, I kept giving talks and I kept saying, you know, you're ready to be the teacher uh, when you're happy. I kept trying to figure out a way to get it across. That this was a very unhappy person that had something to prove and was constantly on a campaign to save people. And I kept trying to go, and how can I, how can I phrase this so it will get across to them that you don't get to go out and tell people how to be happy until you're happy. And so I just started saying it that way. I, I kind of sh shied away from saying, well, you don't, get to need, you don't get to talk about enlightenment until you're enlightened. Because, okay, yeah, all right, and who's judging that? And how big does, how big does your enlightenment have to be? I, I, you've heard me say it before. I think almost everybody has had some enlightenment experience. Some little aha, some little uh, view into the greater. I think that the reason people go to meditation centers is because they got a taste. Why else would they sit on a cushion with their knees and back hurting and their mind driving them crazy if they didn't get a little tiny taste, see a little bit of a window of what was possible for them to experience? So I think everybody's had a little enlightenment experience. But usually we don't let them teach until they've had a little bit bigger experience. A little bit bigger. It doesn't have to be real big. Because this practice is a life practice. So if we wait until somebody is so fully realized there's nothing left for them to learn, we have to go to the cemetery. Because there would be no place else to see them. So I kept trying to say to this person, why don't you wait with this talking to people about how to be happy in life until you're happy in life. Never sunk in. So then we, I, I turn around and I say to people, well, how important is your career to you? And if your career is everything to you and nothing else exists, then you probably don't want to be a monk this life. And Nagachita, who I love dearly, <laughs> used to laugh. We had a friend who talked about his career as a monk and Nagachita thought that was absurd. I never thought it was absurd, but I just left it alone. Because I could see somebody describing, and they usually do in the literature, they talk about a monk who's 80 years old and he had a great career as a monk because he established this temple and taught this group and did this thing and did that thing and ordained lots of monks and everything, so he had a very productive career. But that's usually not what we're talking about when we talk about careers. So how important is your career and if you lost it, how much would you suffer? How important is your house and if you lost it, how much would you suffer? How as important are the possessions you have or the authority you have or the influence you have that if you lost it, you would suffer? And that's the question a practitioner has to ask themselves. Because poverty has nothing to do with what you have. You know, uh, traditional Buddhist monks have next to nothing. I have a whole bunch of stuff. I have a whole closet full of robes, which breaks the old rules, but is really practical today. It's practical because when I, one of my students said to me, I'd like to buy you, I'd like to buy you a couple of robes in the new color. Mary's seen the new color. She likes me in it, you know, the kind of, yellow ochre type of sort. You know, you saw me that one day. It's, well, that looks really good. Yeah, I've got a couple of those now. This is my winter robe, though, Mary. That's because it's real heavy. That's uh, So, you know, I'm doing the fashion thing now. And, they, and this disciple said, do you need uh, a couple robes? Well, no. No, but I've learned in my old age never to say no. Because uh, people come through here you know, Vui Mung has a robe that belonged to Mudita, that belonged to me because I was at a temple down in Orange County and this monk that I've known for a very long time came out and said, do you need a robe? And I went, sure. 
And he says, well, I've got this robe and it's really too big for me. So I'd like to give it to you. And I said, thank you very much. And I brought it back and I looked at it and thought, I can't wear that. And I put my arm in it and it would be like putting my leg in it and it didn't fit. So I hung it in the closet and then Mudita came along and I gave it to Mudita. And then we lost Mudita and so it passed on to Vui Mum. So when he said, do you need a robe? I don't just think about, I got plenty of clothes. I really do. I don't want to discourage anybody watching this video to say he's got all the clothes he needs and we'll never give him anything else. Because it's kind of nice. I got this robe, and this was a total mistake. This was supposed to be one of those colored, the, you know, the brown gold colored robe, and the guy did the wrong thing when he was in Vietnam. So the monk that bought it for me wasn't happy. This was for my 70th birthday. That's what this robe was. But I was just tickled pink, and I told him, my goodness, it's nice heavy cloth, and it's so cold where I live, and it's wonderful to have this heavy robe. And, uh, and I'll hang on to, he gave me two, and I'll hang on to this uh, until some monk comes by that doesn't have a heavy robe and he needs a robe, and then maybe if he's my size, I'll pass it on to him. And then maybe I won't. You know, maybe I'll give him something else. But this is an issue of attachment. For the first 20 years of my life as a monk, I own two robes. I own the brown robe and the yellow robe. That's all I have. And it got to be a little iffy because that poor old brown robe, I had to be careful what I wore under it because it got so thin you could see whatever it was I had on. And then the Buddha smiled on me and let me get connected with somebody that could get me some robes. So it's never a question of what you have, it's a question of your attachment to what you had because the Buddha said, the discontent and the unhappiness and the suffering in the world comes from how attached we are to what we have. It's not what we have. It's our attachment to it. So can we let it go and still be happy? If we can, if we honestly can, then it's all right. If we can't, then we probably need to think about, there was a Zen monk who had studied sutras all his life and wrote about these sutras and was writing books and one day he realized he didn't understand anything and he put all the books in a pile and burned them. So maybe I don't suggest that you burn what you have but you can give it away until you can reach a poverty of mind where you can be free from your attachment and then you can go ahead and own a nice guitar and that's okay. I've, by the way, Mary, I've started giving guitars away. It's time. Having turned 70, I need to find new owners for them. So if you have something that you're really too attached to, give it to somebody.